Well, good morning. Um, bear with us if we have some technical difficulties or just enjoy the blue screen. Um, you know, I, have, I want to start by saying, uh, you know, we have a six-month uh, daughter. She's been, she's been alive for six months. Her name is Heidi. And uh, one of the things that was the most difficult for us as parents was choosing the name of the child. And um, I don't know if, you, if any parents had that struggle, Anyone, people who have kids in here. Um, I mean, it was like up to the last minute, what are we going to name this kid? I was thinking the whole time, I want the baby to have a name that is like goofy, that rhymes, that someone can make fun of them. And, um, you know, <clears throat> I really still stand by that, but we didn't go that route. Probably for good reasons. But have you ever met someone that had a name that was just like the craziest thing you ever heard? Maybe there's some people in here. Maybe a funny name that rhymes or you thought, man, what were these parents thinking? Why did this happen this way? Um, think about that for a minute. Think about a name. And uh, I'm going to run to the back real quick and see if we can get this to connect. Hold on one second. Oh, there we go. Okay, so these are real names. Um, what, this first name is, um, by the way, I have to confess the show The Voice. Anyone watch The Voice in here? It's a singing competition. You can make fun of me for liking it, but I like it. I watch it often. By the way, all these names are gonna, I'm going to share with you are real, uh, real names. They're verified. So the first one is, uh, this is a contestant in the last season. His name was Mendeleev, Galileo, Einstein, Pythagoras, Darwin, Elucid, Leonardo, Alan Blitz. I think Alan's probably the weirdest name in that one. Um, actually his real name, you know, you think, what is this? What were the parents even thinking when they did this? Um, it's kind of funny, right? I think he went by Lev instead of all of that. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is from Singapore. Batman Ben Superman. Uh, hey, you know it's real. It's on his driver's license. So there you go. Um, <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Here's an, uh, another contestant from The Voice, actually. Real name, Thunderstorm Artis. You know, and he, he was very good. Um, I got another one. Cooking with Poo is this lady's, uh, her first name is Poo. Uh, she's from Thailand. Uh, real book, real person. She went with that cookbook, Cooking with Poo. Don't know if that was a good idea, but uh, at least the food on the picture of the book looks pretty good. Um, here's another one. Hitler Mussolini, actual name, this, this guy has passed away, but I looked him up. He was like the police chief in, somewhere in Brazil. And, um, you know, we thought, was he born before the 1930s? I hope so. Um, <laughs> that's a very unfortunate name, right? Have you ever met someone who had like an offensive name or just a name that you just thought, oh, why? Well, you, your parents cursed you with that name. Well, that's kind of what I want to talk about today is the name, the name of Jesus specifically. Uh, I appreciate the songs that we sang this morning, um, you know, about the theme of the name of Jesus. And, um, you know, the passage we're going to read here in John, we're in John 10, um, focuses on the Jesus, uh, the, his name, and the claims that he's made about himself in regards to his name. But first, a little review. You guys are familiar with these, passage, or these uh, texts here. The I am statements of the book of John. Um, there's actually a few others that aren't on the list, but these are the big ones that people remember. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep or the sheep gate. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. And um, we, we kind of uh, deal with I am the door of the sheep and I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10. Of course, in um, John chapter 8, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And many times throughout Scripture, Jesus is making these claims that he is God. Now, this is a core belief of Christianity is that Jesus is God in the flesh. Um, in fact, the, the time that Jesus is born, it says that um, the angel Gabriel came, comes to uh, uh, Joseph and Mary and uh, says, hey, you're going to have a son, and his name is Jesus. So what does the name of Jesus mean? It means... God saves, or God is salvation. And uh, his, his name was given by an angel. I don't know how many people that you know, were, their, their name was actually given by an angel. That makes Jesus quite special in this ordeal. 
And then, of course, the question is, well, what is God's name? And that goes all the way back to, of course, Mount Sinai, uh, the burning bush scenario, where Moses is there, and there's a bush burning, and God is there speaking to him for the flames. It says the angel of the Lord um, appears, and then it says God speaks to him through the flames. Very interesting passage, for sure. But uh, God's name, um, or the Hebrew, this is just all review for you guys, the Hebrew of uh, Y W. H, or excuse me, Y-H-W-H, and, uh, which we say as Yahweh, which in, Gen- in Exodus 3 it says that his name is I am that I am, or I am the one who is. And uh, all these claims that Jesus make in the New Testament are directly connected to the name of God. And that's kind of the one, one of the things I want to focus on today is that Jesus, the things that he was saying were either blasphemous or they were true. And so let's uh, pick up in John chapter 10. So go with me there in your Bibles, John 10. So John 10, starting in verse 22. It says, At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So a couple things about the Feast of Dedication. Uh, this is a worthy thing to note. Um, it's also called the Festival of Lights. Today it's called Hanukkah. And Hanukkah um, is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's only mentioned, um, well, this one time in Scripture, I believe. And uh, it takes place in winter. And it's dealing with the, the time, the intertestamental period where the Jews were... Um, living, you know, in a time where they were occupied by the Seleucids. Antiochus Epiphanes had come and he set up an altar of Zeus in the temple of God and sacrificed a pig in it. The most blasphemous and unholy thing he could have done. And in 165 um, B.C., the Jews revolted and kicked him out, and then they, they had the Festival of Lights. They rededicated the temple to the Feast of Dedication. So it was being practiced in Jesus' day. It's worth mentioning. It's kind of cool that... Um, this is one of those things mentioned in the book of Maccabees um, in the Apocrypha, and it was being celebrated in Jesus' day. So it was winter. It takes place in the uh, colonnade of Solomon, which um, here's what that looks like. <laughs> it's a place uh, around the temple where there's columns that um, they would have been able to walk in the shade in the, the heat of the day. And uh, lots of things took place there. Okay, yeah, here's an example. Um, so we know Jesus was standing at that very place at the time it happened. Let's see if I can walk a little closer. <clears throat> there we go. There it is. A little animation there. So uh, there's what it would have looked like. A lot of people there. A lot of uh, people talking to Jesus. And they come to him and they say this. They say, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Jesus in this passage is saying, you know, I told you who I am, but you don't believe me. And you, you don't believe the, the works that I'm doing, even though I'm doing these in the name of the Father, which is a very bold statement. And he says, you know, you don't believe me. You're part of my sheep. You're not part of the sheepfold. Um, and, and the miracles weren't really the thing that got it for him. They, they were like, okay with that. We're going to read that here in a bit. But he says, I give them eternal life, which is a very bold statement. And then my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. Um, he's, you know, he says, I and the Father are one. So a lot of people get tied up on, you know, they ask the question, did Jesus ever claim that he was God? And the answer is, well, absolutely. Unequivocally, the answer is yes, he claims that he is God in the flesh. But you won't find the phrase, I am God, coming from Jesus' mouth. One b- reason being, well, we're reading it in English. The original language doesn't record Jesus saying this. But we do have him saying the I am statements. I and the Father are one. Um, the way he speaks 
connects his name directly to God's name. Um, his name means God saves, or God is salvation, right? So I and the Father are one. So what happens next? It says, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? So I want to think about this for a minute. When's the last time you met, like those names I gave the example of, when's the last time you met someone and you, you, you heard their name and you thought, I'd like to stone them? Anyone? Anyone had gotten so angry at someone you thought, let's go gather some rocks, let's stone someone? Um, it's really barbaric, right? But in the, the eyes of the Jews that were there in the temple, the, some of these you know, ultra-religious relig people, they're just saying, you know what, we're going to... We know the Bible better than this guy. We know the Old Testament law better than he does. Let's get some stones and stone him because he's committed blasphemy. You know, it's hard to relate to this story. But in their eyes, they're thinking, well, we know more than he does. We hold to the scriptures more closely than he does. In fact, he's committing blasphemy. And some of you are probably thinking, well, I've heard that term blasphemy before, but what exactly does it mean? Um, little definition here. Um, you know, it's to speak evil of God is the most simple way to put it. But the act of offense or speaking sacrilegiously, calling God something deplorable. Um, one example would be, you know, what, the, what Antiochus did in the temple. Like I said, he sacrificed a pig to the altar of Zeus in the temple of God. It was the ultimate blasphemy or abomination, right? But they're saying that Jesus is speaking evil of God because he's elevating himself as a man to be God. But... The problem is, Jesus is telling the truth. Going back here to this passage, he says, it is, not, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? So he says, I've shown you many good works, but they said, you know, we don't, we don't really want to stone you for the miracles. We're okay with that, which is kind of funny. It's like, you're okay with like some miraculous stuff happening. It's someone, you know, their sight being completely re restored, uh, lame being healed and walking. Yeah, we're cool with that but we want to stone you because the things that you're saying. So he quotes this passage uh, in Psalm 82. So if you look in your footnotes in your Bible, it'll say, I said you are gods is a quote from Psalm 82. So why does he do that? But first let's talk about, when the screen gets there, uh, let's talk about Leviticus 24. Why would the Jews want to stone him? Well, it's because of Leviticus 24. An Israelite woman's, uh, and the woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed and they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shemol Shemoleth, and the daughter of Dibri, the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. So remember, they're living in the wilderness. They're like, what do we do with this blasphemer? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of, people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall he be put to death. So we do have an example in scripture where someone was stoned for blaspheming the name of God. It's very extreme, but this is the passage that the Jews had in mind. They, they thought, Jesus, this guy, he's blaspheming the name of God. It's time to pick up the rocks. We're going to make this happen. We're going to stone him. It would have been a very gruesome sight. Um, but Jesus decides to quote Psalm 82. So let's read it. It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. So look context here. Where is this taking place? In the heavenly realms, the divine council, a council of heavenly beings. Okay? That's the context of Psalm 82. Not happening on earth. Uh, eternal a uh, supernatural event, God in his heavenly courtroom. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. 
They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High. All of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So you're probably thinking, what? Why would Jesus quote this? In fact, um, John 10, in this passage, is probably the most, one of the most skipped over passages uh, in, the, in the book of John. Because when you read John 10, and you read that quote from Jesus in Psalm 82, we're like, what is he talking about? Now, when he says, uh, he quotes verse 6, I said you were God, sons of the Most High. Um, the Mormons take this verse uh, a way different way than most people would. They say, well, that affirms that one day we too shall be gods. Because he's saying that these people that are about to stone me are gods. Well, I would say that's an unsatisfactory interpretation. Because when you look at the first verse here of Psalm 82, um, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. The word that stands out in this passage is Elohim. So the same word, <laughs> we're just blinking here. The same word uh, for God is, all, is equally the exact same word found in Hebrew for gods. Isn't that troubling or problematic or bizarre even? So... Why would God, the almighty God, be Elohim, and then the lower G gods also be Elohim? Well, it's taking place in the divine council. And uh, God, we can know from the context of the Hebrew that he's referring to plural Elohim, but the word is just Elohim and Elohim. It's very troubling, but it shouldn't be, because Jesus is affirming, affirming his divinity, that his parent is God, that he was born of God and the Holy Spirit of, of, of a woman and God, right? And he's quoting this passage to say, well, there's room in Scripture for divinity, you know, in me. I'm in the council. I'm the one who appeared uh, to the prophets. Um, I'm the one in the Old Testament where it says the word of the Lord appeared um, many times in the Old Testament. Uh, many scholars will say that's a Christophany. When Jesus appears, or when the word of the Lord appears, it was an actual thing that they saw, or an angel that they saw in the form of an angel, but some say it's the a Christophany, Jesus pre-incarnate. Um, I don't know exactly what it was, but I think that's a good explanation. So what does Elohim mean? It means a lot of things. I'm going to show a video here in a minute, but it's a spiritual being of st or state, so it can refer to God. He's the God Almighty, the only true, the highest Elohim, or it can refer to the sons of God, the B'nai Ha Elohim. Those are not referring to human sons of God. In fact, the word Elohim never refers to a human. It refers to uh, angels or fallen angels, demons, false gods, and of course it could be the, the spirit of someone who has, has passed. The example being in uh, you know, Samuel when uh, Saul goes to uh, the witch of Endor and raises Samuel from the dead. He's referred to as an Elohim. But it never refers, at, uh, the word Elohim never refers to someone like us, a human. We are sons of God in human form, but God also has angelic sons of God. Now I have a video I want to show that will help explain this. I'm going to turn my mic off and hopefully it works for us. When most people think about the story of the Bible, when most people think When most people think about the story of the Bible, they think of a story about God and humans. But remember, we learned that there's a whole other cast of characters that appears throughout the Bible and plays a really important role. Right. Spiritual beings, angels, demons, and the like. Right. And in the Bible, they inhabit the heavenly realm, which is parallel to our earthly reality and actually overlaps with it. Now, all of these spiritual beings have their own unique characteristics. But here's what's fascinating. The biblical authors have one word that can refer to all the inhabitants of the spiritual realm. In Old Testament Hebrew, the word is Elohim, and in New Testament Greek, it's Theos. But here's the thing. This word gets translated in lots of different ways depending on which being is referred to. Angels, gods with a lowercase g, or even God with a capital G. Wait, so one word can refer to any of these beings? Yeah. It's because Elohim is a category title. It can designate any spiritual being that belongs to the heavenly realm. Okay, a title, not a name. 
Like the word mom. Yeah, right. The word mom can refer to lots of really different kinds of people, but they all share in common the same role in a family. And then let's say a group of brothers and sisters are talking and one says, hey, it's mom's birthday. They're using the title like it's a name. But it would be clear that they're referring not to any mom, but their mom. Yes, and the same goes for the biblical authors. They called their God Yahweh, which is the name revealed to Moses. But they also sometimes refer to him with the category title Elohim, using it like a name, because they all know who they're referring to. Okay, but don't the biblical authors think that Yahweh is in a class of his own, not like any other? They do, which is why they say things like Yahweh is the Elohim of Elohim, that is, the chief Elohim among all the others. Or they'll say, there's no Elohim beside Yahweh, meaning no other spiritual being compares to him because only he is the ruler and creator of all things. Okay, I'm following, but I thought the Bible taught monotheism, which means there's just one God. Well, the biblical authors are claiming that among all of the spiritual beings out there, only one is the source and creator of all things, including the Elohim. That's biblical monotheism, that one Elohim, Yahweh, is above all other Elohim, that is, the other spiritual beings. Now, with all that said, we are ready to learn more about who these other Elohim are and how they fit into the biblical story. So hopefully um, that made a little bit more sense to you. Uh, that it could be explained with a little visual image there. Um, <laughs> I would encourage you to go to BibleProject.com and check out their other videos on spiritual beings. They're quite uh, helpful and insightful. But hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you. Like, what is an Elohim? Well, it's a word that can refer to God, but it also can refer to lots of other things, spiritual beings in the Old, in the Old Testament. But, you know, John, in John 10, Jesus is, you know, he's, he's referring to this, this passage and quoting Psalm 82 because he's saying, Wait, you're about to stone me for blaspheming, but there's room in the Old Testament scriptures for two powers in heaven, or really affirming the, the concept of the Trinity. Um, you can see that in the burning bush, you know, the fire, it's burning, the spirit, and then the God speaking, but the angel's present, the angel appeared. Um, but he's saying, hey, you know, there's this concept of, in Psalm 82, there's this divine heavenly council, and there's gods, there's Elohim present. He's saying, I am... God. He's, I'm one of those people there. Um, verse 35, it says, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Remember, there's room in the Old Testament for that. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. This is not the first time he escaped their grasp and was not the first time that he was about to be stoned. But he, uh, he basically says, hey, guys, you thought you knew scripture really well, but I know it better. And uh, he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. This was a very offensive thing for him to say. But that concept is in the Old Testament. And uh, here's the, probably the best example is this. In Exodus 23, um, God says this, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Now I'll say this. Jesus is not an angel. Um, Hebrews is very clear of that. But in Exodus 23, I, I tend to lean towards the, I don't know exactly what happened here. But it does make sense that this is a Christophany, or Jesus appearing to God's people, um, representing the presence of God, and the name of God was in him. It's the same language that's used in John, um, that the Father was in him. And so to the Jews, when he says these things, very offensive. It's, it's extremely blasphemous to them, unless it's true. And so um, I hope this gives you something to, to think about and to meditate on this week. I, I would encourage you with this, this thought. One, um, my challenge to you this week is study your Bible more. Um, maybe you haven't read John 10. Maybe you're confused about what we just talked about. Well, study it more. 
Um, learn about the divine counsel. Learn about what Elohim really means. And two, I want you to meditate on the name of Jesus. What does the name of Jesus mean to you? And what does that mean for your life this week? How are you going to live differently knowing who Jesus is, who he claimed to be, a core doctrine of Christianity, that Jesus is God in the flesh? And if you believe that, how are you going to live differently knowing that? I will give you this uh, charge that um, if you do, you should be living a different life. And um, of course, maybe you haven't come to that realization that, that Jesus is God. He's not was God, he is God. Um, and he's one of the, he's the very nature and essence of God. But when we believe, obviously, in Jesus, we put our faith in him, we re repent of our sins, and we confess that we believe that he is Lord, and we, of course, would be baptized in water, for the forgiveness of sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that's how Christians have responded to the gospel. Um, at this time, we're going to stand and sing. If you need to respond in any way, please do so now. <laughs>